Brewers outfielder Jackson Churio is in some pretty elite company. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked On MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, baseball writer and podcaster, and thank you for making this your first listen every single day. And if you remember us going over the top 100 from Baseball America and MLB Pipeline a few weeks ago, one of the consensus top 10 players in baseball was Brewers outfielder Jackson Churio. So IFA in the 2021 class... Uh, went to the DSL as a 17-year-old. Uh, finished the year 296, 386, 447 with five home runs at age 17. Uh, started off slow, picked it up at the end of the year. And then this year has been absolutely electric. He has been an 18-year-old, time divided between low A and high A. And his stats on the year, 302, 356, 573 with 20 home runs. And the 20 home run mark is significant because that's where he joined some pretty elite company. So didn't go to the Arizona Complex League at all. Um, One of the youngest players in the Futures game. But then hit he's hit 20 home runs in his age 18 season without spending any time in rookie ball this year. So there is... Since 2006, only five players have done this. So obviously his 20. um, 2017, a fellow you may have heard of, Fernando Tatis Jr. Hit 22 home runs in 131 games. And then in 2008, Giancarlo Stanton hit 39 home runs in 125 games. So pretty elite company. But this in and of itself does not necessarily mean he's going to, he's guaranteed to be a star at the big league level. Uh, The other two guys that have done this are guys that did not, either did not or have not yet panned out as prospects. So on, in that same Padres organization in 2017, Third baseman Hudson Potts also hit 20 home runs in 125 games. And you may be asking, well, where is Hudson Potts? He was the first rounder in 2016, did that in 2017. He is now in double A with the Boston Red Sox and is currently uh, not in top list. So he was traded uh, in a minor league trade in late August of 2020. So was at the alternate training site, um, was traded by the Padres, and is now a double-A prospect for the Red Sox, unranked in their top 30. And the issue here, when you look at it, is he's got too much swing and miss. So 68 games this year in Portland, double-A Portland, 224, 289, 437, 12 home runs, 87 strikeouts. Last year... In double A Portland, 217, 264, 399, 11 home runs, 100 strikeouts in 78 games. So we talk about this all the time on this show, right? Your power tool is only as good as your contact tool. If you can't make enough contact, it doesn't matter how much power you have. You're not going to be a 30 home run guy. So there, there has been improvement year over year in Hudson Potts. And, and his numbers, what he, you know, what he's done as far as the strikeouts are down a little bit. Uh, the walks are up. The home runs are, you know, static, but in less games. Uh, batting average is uh, higher, not much. It's a margin of error, essentially. Um, slugging's up just about 40 points. Like, there's, there's signs that this may still work out, but he's age 23 in AA, still trying to make that happen. And then the other guy was 2007 Nationals prospect uh, Chris Marrero. He hit 23 home runs in 125 games. Uh, He 
Made his debut in 2013 with Washington. Played in eight games, hit 125. Um, Did not make it back to the bigs until 2017 with the San Francisco Giants, where in 15 games he batted 132, 171, 211, and then was out of baseball. So, just being on this list does not automatically mean that Jackson Churio is going to be a um, is going to be a no doubt star in the big leagues. But there's some interesting things here. One, even if Jackson Churio plays in every single one of the games left for high A, unless he goes to double A Biloxi for the last week of the season, he's not going to play in a hundred games. Um. Another guy outside of this time frame, but I, I I had a feeling about this. I went back and looked, and um, Andrew Jones did this in 1985. He had 25 home runs in 139 games. I am not comparing Andrew Jones to Jackson Churio. I just thought that was interesting as well as far as who's done that. And then I think we kind of forget Giancarlo Stanton's year was so good. In 2008, he hit 39 home runs. In 125 games. Like, holy cow, that is a lot of home runs in the minor leagues. Never mind for a guy who was 18 years old. Uh, So, it's good company. It means good things. And if uh, David Gasper, who came on to do our Brewer show with us, I joined him on the Futures Focus Dynasty Baseball podcast that Prospects 1500 did. It's, uh, It's out there in their feeds, published last Sunday. At one point in time, we were asked to pick Ellie De La Cruz or Jackson Churio. He took Churio, I took De La Cruz, and we went back and forth on it. And his big takeaway, the reason he took Churio, is his own minor league manager compared him to Ronald Acuna Jr. So, uh, obviously, lofty praise, lofty, lofty company that he's in. Uh, and looks like he he has all the potential in the world, could do it. Uh, but obviously, just being on this list is not a guarantee of success. We learned that from Hudson Potts and Chris Marrero. In just a minute, I mentioned it briefly yesterday, but I want to go more in depth on the promotion of Tristan Cassis for the Red Sox, because I've got a couple questions about him as a prospect. And I don't know if he's properly valued. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Blue Chew. Summer's winding down. The nights are getting longer, but the breeze isn't the only thing that's getting stiff. That's right. This episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Guys, we know that confidence can take you far in life. That's especially true in the bedroom especially when it's time to step up to the plate. That's where Blue Chew comes in. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Viagra, and Cialis, but in chewable tablets at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or you can just be ready when an opportunity arises. Uh, The process is simple. You sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you receive your prescription within days. And the best part, it's all done online. So no visit to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy for the tech to make eye contact with you and kind of grin a little bit. Blue Shoes tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped directly to your door in a discreet package. So here's how, here, here's what it comes down to, okay? We are in... Uh, a pennant chase right now. We are heading to the playoffs. You got to have your best stuff, okay? You don't want to step up to the mound, throw in 88, 89 mile an hour fastballs. You want the good stuff, right? You know, <laughs> you. and so if you need a little more zip on your fastball, talk to our friends at Blue Chew. We've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code Locked On at checkout. You just pay $5 for shipping. So that's bluecrew.com, promo code Locked On to receive your first month for free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. Okay, Tristan Cassis just got called up by the Red Sox. Uh, first base prospect would have been here earlier 
had an ankle injury. Story here, 26th overall prospect in the 2018 draft, was the third baseman. They moved him to first base. Uh, got some pretty aggressive promotions in his time, actually. They moved him They moved him rather early. I want to say he went to... Uh, he spent the age his age 19 season at Greenville and got really good reviews from the 2020 alternate site. And so he came in uh, in the top 100 in 2021 when we did all the 2021 rankings. And I'm trying to figure out if he should be ranked this high or not. So, one, let's understand up front that for a first baseman to contribute, you have to be 10% better offensively than league average just to kind of break even performance-wise because you don't have the same defensive value at first than you would have anywhere else. And we had this conversation when we talked Tyler Soderstrom on Monday's show. You know, he's moving from catching to first base, and so because of that, he doesn't have the same defensive value and his, there's more pressure on his bat. Same thing with Tristan Cassis. Uh, playing first base, he has to be 10% better than average just to break even as far as total production and contributions to the big league team. So, in the minors, um, in 2022, between all of the different levels, it's, he spent most of his time in AAA. He rehabbed a little bit uh, lower, but AAA. 273, 382, 481, 11 home runs, 38 RBIs, 32 extra base hits. Didn't steal any bases, which, I mean, he's 6'4", 250, so that makes sense. He wouldn't steal any bases. And I'm trying to figure out, is Tristan Cassis actually a top 100 prospect or not? Now, when he debuted, I mean, he so far, as of the time of this recording on Wednesday afternoon, he's he's gotten 12 at-bats, two hits, one home run, two RBIs. Uh, they apparently the the they did a lot of work to get that home run ball back too, but so I made a pro and con list about trying to figure out is he genuinely a top 100 prospect or it, was he rated correctly because there's times when it doesn't feel like he should be. Uh, the big thing to me and the reason why I wondered this in the first place was I was going back and checking notes on Tristan Cassis. He's never really dominated a level like you would expect a top prospect to do. So 2019 in A-ball, 254, 349, 472, 19 home runs. Really good production as a 19-year-old, but not like dominating the way you think of a lot of top prospects as dominating. 2021, most of the season was double A. 284, 395, 484, 13 home runs. Uh, feels like very, very, very similar slash line. Better batting average, but like a very similar slash line. Improved the batting average 40 points. Improved the on-base 40 points. Improved the slugging 10 points. Um, And then this year in AAA, like I said, 273, 382, 481, which is practically even from where it was in double A. So never has had those gaudy eye-popping numbers, right? And then obviously, like I said, first hit the top 100 in 2021, which was a really weird year to try to rank prospects. We were going off a lot of like grainy high home footage of uh, of alternate site stuff and things like that. But the flip side is since he's come back from the ankle injury, 40 games in the in triple A, He's hit much better. 309, 416, 537. A lot closer to dominant numbers like you would expect a top prospect to have, albeit not in a full season sample. You know, a smaller season sample. From a scouting perspective, he profiles as a plus hitter. He can cover the entire zone. He can lift the ball, but he doesn't sell out for the launch angle. Um, He isn't pull happy. He has a good approach with two strikes where he kind of chokes up on the bat a bit and focuses on getting the ball in play. Doesn't strike out a ton. You know, none of these seasons, uh, his I mean, his, his strikeout rate never, 
I think his highest was 58 strikeouts in 118 games in 2019 in, in A-ball. Like, for the most part, he doesn't strike out an absolute ton. Um, and then the thing to me, and I think why it's okay that they called him up and they want to try it, is his AAA stats, not the short season sample, but the full AAA stats, are better than what Boston's players have produced this year. So remember, his full season again in AAA. I know it's a lot of numbers today. 273, 382, 481. Here is, you know, and that's like 21% strikeout rate. Here is all of Boston's first baseman together, their performance in games this year. 210, 286, 364. He's 100 points better in on-base, 60 points better in batting average, 120 points better in slugging, and then their strikeout rate's 32.2%. So he's more than 10% better in strikeout rate. So, I mean, at this point, Boston has one of the worst collective slash lines at first base in the entire league. So it's going to be hard for him to be worse than what they've rolled out there this year. And so I think it's going to work out. You saw a home run already. I think it's going to work out. The concern, the one concern that I do have is um, doesn't have a great track record against lefties. 80 AAA at-bats this year against lefties. 224, 350, 269. So he may be on the big, the large side of a platoon to start his career this year. But I do think that Tristan Cassis has the potential to work everything out and to to work. Time will tell whether or not the top 100 placement was correct. Given what he did after the injury, I think it might be. But like we've mentioned before, this, this preview, this time that you get right here um, is incredibly valuable to see where he is and what he needs to work on as you look at him taking over the first base job out of spring training next year. In just a minute, uh, we had, there was a big development in the unionization efforts. Uh, Major League Baseball Players Association, like I predicted, made a big announcement uh, on Tuesday morning. And I want to get to that right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. Okay, so you'll remember last Tuesday, we talked about uh, they had sent out, and I say they, the Major League Baseball Players Association had sent out um, authorization cards to every minor leaguer asking them to vol- like to, to choose the Players Association as their designated union representative. Well, uh, on that show, I talked about uh, s- Monday was the goal for the Players Association to announce that rather than asking for an election, They had an overwhelming majority of cards returned and they were asking for voluntary recognition. That letter was officially sent Tuesday, first thing Tuesday morning. So I said Monday, I think I forgot it was a holiday. So that letter was sent first thing Tuesday morning asking the players, uh, asking Major League Baseball to recognize the Players Association as the union for minor leaguers. We don't know the exact percentage Uh, of cards that have already been returned as a yes, but we know that it's already over 50%. We don't, again, we don't know the exact amount. We just know it's over 50%. So the way that this works, and the quote from Tony Clark, Executive Director of the Players Association, said, minor league players have made it unmistakably clear they want the Major League Baseball Players Association to represent them and are ready to begin collective bargaining in order to positively affect the upcoming season. Um, the executive board had voted unanimously. And the, the, the executive board is full of the players, of Major League Baseball players who were selected as reps. I think like Scherzer's on there, Francisco Lindor's on there, you know, like big name players. They voted unanimously to support this and to do this. So there's a couple options that can happen now. Option number one is Major League Baseball management can voluntarily recognize the union. Now, this is something that has happened before. When basketball, when the NBA went through this same process where the minor leaguers were, were their version of minor leaguers were unionizing, 
the NBA voluntarily recognize the union. So if that happens, one, Major League Baseball gets the positive PR. I mean, this is a batting practice fastball, MLB. Just, you know, recognize the union, crush this one out of the park, take the positive PR. So if that happens, the union becomes official. And typically to do that, what you'll do is you'll have, uh, they might call it a card check, you'll have a certification kind of thing. So what happens is an independent third party, which will either be the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, or uh, a a, a private organization will certify the cards. So they will confidentially look at uh, a representative sample of the SARDs, uh, of the cards and cross-reference those with active minor league baseball rosters to confirm that the cards were signed by active minor leaguers uh, just to certify that they're valid. So uh, if minor league baseball chooses to voluntarily recognize the union, then that that is the process that will happen and then it will be recognized. Once it's recognized, which could be as quick as the end of the month, uh, then the Players Association can begin negotiating a collective bargaining agreement for the minor league players. Quick reminder, that will be separate from the major league collective bargaining agreement. So they are separate agreements. But um, if they're smart, they will either have them expire at the same time to just have one negotiation, or they will have it completely offset from the from the major league players so that those those negotiations are divided by a significant amount of time. So I could see something where this one covers all the way through the end of the player development license. It covers the next, you know, eight or nine seasons. If Major League Baseball does not want to voluntarily recognize the union, if they decide, no, we don't want this positive PR, we don't want this slam dunk uh, batting practice fastball to get crushed out here, then the National Labor Relations Board can receive a petition from the Major League Baseball Players Association to hold an election. Now, if they have over 50% of cards, then they have the minimum 30% required for an election. So the way that this works is the cards are certified. That's going to happen either way. The cards are certified. And then the NLRB consults with both the union and management to figure out when and where to schedule the election. The issue that you have is you are coming up on the end of the season. Depending on the level, minor league baseball plays for another week or two weeks or three weeks and then they're done. And the minimum amount of time from when you submit the petition to the NLRB to when they can hold an election at best is 16 days. And that's not like an arbitrary number that is like set in procedures and regulations. So 16 days, which brings you, if that petition were submitted today, the soonest you could have a draft is like the 23rd or 24th of the year. Most of the minor leagues are done by then. So what probably ends up happening in that situation is your 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 union election gets pushed to next spring. Now, you know, during spring training. Now, because you're going to have turnover in the offseason, guys who are going to retire guys who will be traded or their contracts will expire and they will sign with new minor league baseball teams, things like that. I could very much see a situation where Major League Baseball asks for a new authorization card process. They make the claim that there's been enough turnover in the bargaining unit, the group of minor league players who are subject to this, that, that we need a new authorization card process to go through. So the, the Player Association would have to send cards back out, do that process again, and then submit those to NLRB for another check and then to have an election scheduled. Which I feel like at best means you're looking at having uh, an election sometime during the season and then... Obviously, my Major League Baseball is going to probably try to push and delay that. And then whenever the election's done and the results are certified by an LRB, then you have to figure out, okay, you know, once it's finally certified and we have a union, 
then you can start collectively bargaining. And so there is a there is a world here. There's a possibility here where Major League Baseball does the wrong thing, wouldn't be unprecedented, delays the entire process into the middle of next season, and then once once there is a dedicated once the election has happened and there is a minor league union established via election through the NLRB, the owners try to find some way to disrupt the season during negotiations. The owners lock out the lock out the minor league players. There is a possibility the minor league players go on strike. I don't think they would do that during the season. I think they would rather open a season versus cutting off a season short. But um, either way, there is the possibility if Major League Baseball does not voluntarily recognize the union that next season somehow gets disrupted. Now, again, being clear here, if next season gets disrupted, it is Major League Baseball's fault. The best option by far in everybody's opinion is for Major League Baseball to voluntarily recognize the union right now because they just settled a a lawsuit for hundreds of millions of dollars about unpaid wages during spring training and extended spring and instructional league. Uh, The Congress is looking at the antitrust exemption. The Supreme Court has talked about the antitrust exemption should not exist. So Major League Baseball if they fight this as hard as they have the ability to, they run the risk of losing spectacularly and really messing things up. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully they do the right thing. Great rest of the week this week. Tomorrow, uh, Farm Friday, the Atlanta Braves. Really interesting system because they've graduated some guys. They brought in a lot of prep pitchers. Excited to talk about that. If you made it this far in the video on YouTube, do us a favor, go ahead and subscribe. Really does help the show a ton. If you're listening on audio, go into your podcast app, leave us a review. We do see those. Those help with the algorithmic discovery and things like that. It does help a ton. But until we talk tomorrow, this has been Locked on MLB Prospects. Mm -hmm.